Senator Lawson, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, Dr. Greener, how are you, sir? Good to see you. Sir. Awesome. You. I am awesome. Well, the pleasure is mine. So I know your time is valuable, so we'll get right to it. Um, you've served uh, in Vietnam. Then you came back. You were a Delaware State Police officer. You served an entire career with the Delaware State Police. Uh, you're a small business owner. Uh, I, I patronized your business a good bit. And, um, and then I, you just didn't understand the word retirement. I have a good buddy, Jerry, has no understanding what that word means. And so he's working harder in retirement than, than he's ever worked in, in his career. So the question is, why in the world did you decide to run for senator in the state of Delaware? Well, I had no interest in politics. I went to see a seated senator at the time uh, on an issue that was very near and dear to me. And I essentially was told, let them find their own way and was ushered out of the office more hmm. than once. And I was talking to my wife and talking to a mentor. And he said, well, they change it. I said, what do you mean change it? He said, run or be quiet. And I can't be Even quiet. If, quiet. if you could speak up or put your mouth closer to the thing, to the uh, microphone, that'd be great because uh, folks are struggling to hear you. All right. Is that better? Yes, much better. All right. So anyway, my wife and I prayed about it, argued about it, prayed about it some more, and decided to run, and the rest is history. Now let me ask you, when you when you ran for Senate, did some magical thing happen uh, where suddenly you had all the knowledge of the world and you, uh, you were able to, um, without even thinking about it, you were able to know things that previously as a private citizen as a state police officer and as a businessman that suddenly you knew everything. It just, just this magical, amazing knowledge just popped into your head when you walked into the legislative hall in Delaware and over Delaware. Did that happen? No, I felt like a dog that chased a car and caught it. <laughs> well, you know what? That's the thing. I mean, that's the crazy thing about what we think about politicians is we think now there are some folks that um, they will they will become politicians because they've always wanted to be a politician and that's they've gone to school. They've always wanted to be that. And uh, that is their destiny in, in, in their opinion. So they prepare themselves for that. And really and truly that, you know, I'm not saying that there's anything at all wrong with that. Nothing at all wrong with that. It is, it is a, an honorable profession if you're honorable in performing the profession. So you go and you do that uh, in, the, in the district in which you live and so take us to the day uh, that everybody, I, I've done, I don't know how many interviews now all across the country, uh, in Washington uh, State, California, uh, ultra-liberal outlets, you name it. Uh, and we've, we've been on them, and we've taken calls and debates and all that stuff. But here you are, you, you and the local, uh, from the local standpoint, you're getting inundated uh, with interviews and, you know, people calling in. Tell us what happened. Take us through your, your, your right before you go in to, uh, you know, the, the legislative hall and you're, you're there and it's normal day. Everything is normal. And take us from where it, it, uh, it's normal, then it stops being normal. Tell us what happened. Well, every day when we start, we say a prayer and a pledge. And it's recently it's been offered by uh, clergy from from the state, various folks have come in and and offered the prayer at the request of the lieutenant governor, Anthony Hall Long. And the fifth was no different. We came in, took our places, and as we were preparing for the prayer, the opening prayer, she said, today's prayer will be a reading from the Quran. Well, right. prior to that, I I saw cameras being set up and and an imam, and I had no idea that he was taking part in the service. With that, he approached, almost instantly approached the podium, and with that, I could not stay, and I walked out. Hmm. Now, now, uh, did you make a big fuss when you walked out? Was it a big deal? Did you jump up and down, beat any drums, maybe some pots or pans that might have been nearby, um, set off any no, fireworks I, I, or anything? I didn't come equipped with that, so no, I, I had no intentions of doing that. I simply walked out and 
lo and behold, Senator Benini was right behind me. I didn't even know he was coming. There was no time to discuss it. It was, bam, instantly, and it was a reaction. Uh, knowing enough about the Quran, I did not feel that that's where this assembly should be going. Right, 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 right. So, so you go out, uh, you and you and Senator Bernini, uh, you didn't, and I don't know him personally, so I, I can't speak to his and, you know, any of his motives or intention. Uh, but, but, you know, there, suffice it to say, we can, we can clarify right here on uh, the Collision of Faith and Politics, 1.4 million people listening, we can, uh, we can absolutely guarantee that you and Colin Benini did not have some prearranged plan. Listen, what's going to happen today is the uh, the Lieutenant Governor, Bethany Holong, is going to invite in Muslims to pray, an imam, and we're going to walk out. Let's make a big deal of it. Let's stomp out and uh, let's go out and let's, let, then we'll make a speech. So that didn't happen, correct? That's correct. We had no idea. We That information was not shared with us until as I said, she stood up and made the statement. Uh, there was no collusion. There was nothing. I had no intentions of making fanfare out of it in any way, shape, or form. That's not really my style. And uh, I, I walked out. Mm -hmm. And so you walked out. How long did the prayer last? Uh, it was a couple of minutes from when, when I've seen the video uh, that they put on uh, YouTube, I guess. Uh, it wasn't all that long. It might have been four minutes or less. Wow. So, so then once once you walked out, uh, what happened then? You, you know, you do. You, can you hear the prayer um, ending? I mean, was it a prayer you could hear? No. When you're out in the hallway, you can't hear what's going on in in the chamber. Okay. Awesome. So you go back in. And once you go back in, what do you do? Uh, I stood to be recognized. And when you know, they were wrapping up their camera gear, and the pledge had been said, and I simply stood and expressed my concern over them being in the chamber and reading from the Quran, which calls for our societal demise. And I said, our demise in our house. Mm -hmm. And when I said our house, I meant the people's house, not my house. A lot of people are misinterpreting that. Right. Okay. So, so then, so then once you said, said that, what happened after that? Did, was there, were there any other uh, Republican leaders, GOP leaders, were they right there ready to help you, ready to stand by you? Uh, you know, what, what happened at that point? Did you see people kind of gathering around you saying, yeah, you know, it's his, it's his right. He doesn't have to listen to a, a Muslim prayer. He, it's his First Amendment right to have to have a belief or a, a, an opinion as it relates to uh, uh, the, the tenets of Islam being um, promoted here on the floor of the General Assembly. Did any, did any of that happen? Like, what, what happened next with your colleagues? Well, uh there was nothing really. We went right on into business. Hmm. So there wasn't a, a huge people, brouhaha then. Not at all. Hmm. So not when did all. things start picking up? When did when did things start picking up after this happened? Like what the what were the steps? Because here's the thing: if you if 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 you're to listen to and and ladies and gentlemen, you know you need to understand that Dave Lawson is a very humble man. He uh, like I say I know him personally. I've known him for years. He's a good, intensely good-hearted man. Uh, whenever you see Dave, he most of the time has a big smile on his face. It's not one of those fake smiles. It's a real smile because he's a happy guy. And so Dave is not a person that seeks attention. He doesn't go running around seeking attention. So, you know, and you say, well, yeah, but he's a politician. But listen, you don't, you don't understand. There's two different types of politicians. There's the ones that really, truly want to serve. They want to serve the people. They want to make sure that, that uh, good people are represented uh, in the governing bodies and somebody's got to do the job. And so he steps up to the plate and slings and arrows start falling. So at what point did this thing break loose and, and start to grow a life of its own? Well, when Dr. Bakar came back to pick up his camera, he turned to me and said, 
know, we'd like to talk about this. And would I like to talk about it? And I said, absolutely. You know, mm-hmm. I, I believe that knowledge is power. And that was about it. It was a short exchange. And an hour plus later, Senator McBride gets up and reads a prepared statement uh, of his being offended. That we're okay, so, so, so hold on, hold on, Dave. Hold on, Dave. Folks, if you're driving down the road or you're flying on an airplane or riding on a train anywhere in this world, I know we have uh, 19 countries right now listening. If you're riding around, I want you to understand what Senator Lawson just said. So he spoke to the guy who gave the air quotes prayer, the Muslim prayer, uh, very kindly, not in any way disrespectful or, or judgy, and nothing like that. He had a very brief but very respectful exchange. And then Senator McBride stands up and he already has a prepared statement. Now, Senator an McBride. Hour later, over an hour later. Over an hour later. Over so, an hour so, later. Yes. So instead of doing the people's business, what he's doing is politics and pandering. So he he and his colleagues get together and they say, hey, we got to deal with this. This is a chance for us to gain some steam here with the uh, with the Muslim and the ultra left lobby. So let's draft a statement. So then what happens once he goes to make this statement? Well, he read the statement in length and then repair, repeated the prayer in English. Uh, and at that point, I had no idea. Well, he repeated was, something in English. He, well, he repeated something in English. He, he said something in English. Yeah. Claimed to be the prayer. And no, uh, now folks, put a pin, put a pin in that. Yeah, Senator, put a pin in that because I want to connect, I want to connect the dots here. I want to tether this because uh, this audience has heard me speak of extortion 17 many, many times. Extortion 17 was the call sign of the helo that was shot down, largest single uh, law, single day loss of United States Navy SEALs. And it was the gold team of DevGrew. And that's who was shot down as well as others attached to DevGrew and, and some uh, the Army SOAR team. Or I don't even think it was the SOAR team. I think actually the pilot was a reserve pilot. And their normal flight ops didn't happen. There's a bunch of crazy things that happened. And uh, I've done whole shows on it. If you go to the ninjapastor.com, click on blog, you'll find it there. Uh, just search Extortion 17 and you'll find it. Suffice it to say, there was a ramp ceremony. And the ramp ceremony over there uh, is a a very respectful time. Well, I believe it was Admiral McRaven, who himself uh, is a SEAL. And Admiral McRaven uh, invited for some unknown reason. He invited, oh, I know why, because he wanted to win the hearts and minds of the enemy and the Afghan people. He invited an imam to speak. Now, this is an Afghan imam, not an imam he carried over uh, from the United States didn't know the guy, didn't know how the guy would be. So this imam is there, and the guy prays, and he prays uh, in his own language. It is not interpreted. There was no one there uh, interpreting uh, and or translating. And what ends up happening is everybody just kind of bowed their heads. They didn't really know what to do. Uh, several of the parents were there. They, they're in a foreign land. They've just lost their child. Uh, these other seals are standing there. They're in stunned disbelief. And the guy prays a prayer. Well, it turns out once we had the, and I talked about this when I had Karen and Billy Vaughn on. Uh, Billy wrote the great book, Betrayed, and he's actually about to release another book right now. And in that book, Betrayed, he talked about uh, once we had the, uh, what the guy said translated, it was nothing like a prayer. In fact, he was damning the infidel to hell, them and their progeny, their family, everyone in their circle and the people in America damned to hell. Well, you can imagine how the parents felt when the United States Special uh, Naval Special Warfare and, and JSOC, uh, Joint Special Operation Command, actually allowed this man to speak. Now, they didn't have anybody there to vet the guy, they just let the guy speak. So they let the guy speak and he curses, he curses the dead soldiers, flag draped coffins, and curses them, and then he curses their families in America. Now, so what Senator Dave Lawson is saying is this man stood up. Now, look, I'm not impugning who he is or what he is. Um, I wasn't there. We are awaiting an official recording. Uh, Once we receive that official recording, we are going to have it professionally translated just to know for sure what he said, just to match what he said 
uh, to um, what was actually said, what he said he said, and what he actually said. So we're working on that, and we will let you know. We will follow up and let you know on that. So Senator Lawson, so at that point, you know, he stands up and gives a statement. Senator McBride gives a statement. What does Senator, in, in essence, what does he say? Well, he chastises me for exercising my uh, First Amendment right. Hmm. My ability to stand there and, and voice my objection to what happened. And he hmm. started out with words have consequences. And it went there that he seldom ever chastises or takes exception to a fellow senator's comments, but he felt he had to this time an hour plus later. Mm -hmm. hmm. Now, do we think, we have a pretty astute audience here, do we think, audience, that perhaps, just maybe, just maybe, uh, Lieutenant Governor Bethany Hall Long, who invited the man to come speak or come pray, and perhaps the, the Democrat leadership state of Delaware, I don't know if you guys know, is extremely blue. And do we kind of think at this point that this was maybe a little bit of a setup, but they didn't think that anybody would have uh, the the temerity to stand up and say, oh, no, this won't stand in my house, not in the people's house. What do you think, Dave? Do you think there's any way in the world that maybe they knew this was coming and had been prepared for either way? Maybe you're quiet. Maybe you sit back on your laurels. You let the man pray and, you know, you're going about the people's business. Or maybe you stand up and say, hey, no, 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 hold on, hold on, what are we doing here? Or maybe you peacefully walk out and you come back in, you make a brief statement, and they're prepared, it seemed like, for every eventuality well in advance. Well, I don't think they were. I think they were kind of flat-footed because uh, we, the minority party, are seldom conferred with on anything that goes on. Right. And uh, so I doubt greatly that there was any any preparation for my statement or my reaction, for that matter. But there was a lot of sidebar chatting going on with uh, Senator McBride's staff and uh, instructions obviously being given to his staff by him to prepare some remarks that would, would imply that he was you know, offended by my statements. Sure, and our sure, guests sure. were badly treated. And our guests were badly treated. Really? Well, I don't see that as badly treated. I mean, you had a you had a verbal, uh, a verbal, uh, very brief chat. But I don't was that between you and the uh, the doctor, the Muslim doctor? Was was that in any way contentious? Not at all. Not at all. Uh, it was so. Uh, so who's embarrassed on who? both sides? Well, I, I, so. I, so that's what I'm struggling with. So, so what aspect, what aspect of what you said to and what you did uh, as it relates to the prayer and after the prayer, when you spoke to the doctor, the, the Muslim doctor, what aspect of that in any way could be um, interpreted as disrespectful to the guests? Well, I didn't confront them, I said that the Quran speaks of our demise. I didn't say they did. I didn't accuse them of anything. There was no accusation right. or any confrontation with them. Uh, the Imam and, and Dr. Uh, Bakar, there was no confrontation at all. He said he won, when he came back, we very quietly conversed and very respectfully conversed. Yeah. So there was no, yeah, gotcha. no outburst at all. Nothing. Except so for, all this you and cry... So all this hue and cry on social media and radio and television, um, you know, d describing this as a uh, disrespectful act. And, 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 and I'll just tell you, you know, I've done a ton of interviews since this, this occurred. And I, and I can tell you that uh, when they allowed people to call in, you'd have a lot of people calling in. And first of all, they would impugn uh, the level of education. Uh, some would, would actually say, that, well, this guy is in, has been in Vietnam, you know, he's old, he doesn't, um, you know, he doesn't probably doesn't even know what he's talking about. He's probably not very well educated. And so when I was on and, and they would allow callers, I, I would point to that. When they'd say that, I'd, I'd respond. And sometimes it would even be, uh, there's a particular radio station in the state of Delaware. The regular host was out the day I was on, but then the next 
uh, the next time she talked about this, she was in and she said, well, you know, you have to question the level of intelligence uh, and education, the level of education in people who don't understand that Islam is not the enemy. And, and what is interesting to me, and I've, and I've repeated this uh, many, many times in, in, in every interview that I can, and in every speech I give across the country, I, I explain people, if, if I'm there to speak of Islam, obviously I, I talk about a lot of different things, but Islam is, is one, of, uh, one of my areas of expertise. I'm a subject, subject matter expert. So when I'm talking about that, I explain to people, look, you need to understand, um, this isn't an education thing it's a lack of education thing. And the lack of education is not on the part of the people standing up and waving their arms saying, whoa, 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 slow down, slam dancer. We can't be inviting Islam into our country. It's incompatible. Uh, the Quran absolutely contradicts the United States Constitution. And therefore, anyone who swears an oath to the United States Constitution is committing taqiyya. Now, we talk about lack of education. I read the Quran uh, in, a, in a scholarly way four times. I'm working on my fifth time through. I've studied Islam for over 30 years, three decades. Uh, I've studied it nose to nose with Muslims in their own countries and here and other places in the world. I've studied it at high academic institutions. I have a doctorate in theology. Islam was one of the religions that I chose to study intensely. So I think it's probably pretty fair to say we've got a doctorate degree. I've been studying it for over three decades. I'm probably not the one you want to say is not very well educated. Now, am I a country boy? You better believe I am. But country boys are some of the smartest folks you'll ever run across. That's a whole different show. But they impugned your intelligence as well and your level of education by saying, hey, this guy, you know, he just stands up and says, spouts off, says whatever he thinks comes across his mouth because he's, he's a bigot and he's a misogynist and he's a racist and he's all these things. When in reality, you're none of those things. Now, there was a, I want to ask you about this because there, it appears to me that the news outlets were not trying to get the truth out. They were trying to drive a narrative. And so when they came to you and asked you to be on the different radio shows, uh, what did they tell you you were going to be on for? You know, what, what was the purpose? You're talking to me? Yes. All right. Well, I just did a couple interviews, one with WBOC and one with uh, WHYY, and, and that was about it. I didn't do it. Right. And so so they flipped uh, they flipped those interviews and used those interviews to uh, using sound bites and things of that nature. Now, on uh, there was a radio station in the state of Delaware. I'm not going to give them publicity. There's a radio station on uh, in the state of Delaware. The host on there. Um, she was, she's the one saying, you know, hey, this guy's not very intelligent. Uh, he clearly is a bigot. Um, I don't believe him when he said that he was representing, because this is, this is what she said. She said, look, he said that he was standing up for his constituents because the majority of his constituents, they, uh, they believe, uh, you know, what he believed. And so he's representing them. He's being a fair and good representative of his uh, district. And um, I didn't get a chance to be interviewed on that particular radio station that particular day. I would have loved to. Uh, but but is there any truth to that? Is there any truth to that that's the statement you made initially in one of these interviews? And, um, you know, did you, is that what you said during the course of the interview? Well, there was a reporter that wanted to interview me for that radio or for that radio station and for that show I and when i when i tried to talk with him he became argumentative right and i was trying to answer his questions and he didn't like the answers so he got nasty and i asked him if this was a, a debate an argument or an interview and he said you're not answering my questions and i said sir this interview is over yeah and, uh, because you have cojones you're not some you're not a snowflake. You're you're going to stand up for yourself and and uh, represent for yourself. You're going to advocate for yourself. That's I, I the right way to, to be be cornered by someone who already had a, an agenda, and they, uh, he sure. obviously had an agenda, and it was carried on apparently by the host. I've oh, interviewed absolutely. her many times on many many subjects, and and she knows better than her statements. 
Yeah. So, so then, um, you know, I, 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 there was many callers that called in, but there was one in particular that I want to address some of the things that he said. Now he said he's a Muslim, he's a business owner. He has about 300 employees and he made the statement on the radio and, and she made the statement that you were confronted by this statement that he made, uh, that he said, look, I know Dave Lawson. Um, he, you know, I, uh, I've given him money for his campaign and I'm a Muslim. I'm your neighbor. I'm the businessman. I'm the guy who employs all these people. I'm the guy who, you know, was on the board of this and that. And I, I do all these things. I'm good. I'm, we are your police officers. Muslims are your uh, military people. But yeah, I, you know, I considered him a friend and I was really, uh, I was really disappointed. I was really surprised. I, I was confused when he made that statement, because that's not the Dave that I know. And look, I'm saying this because I gave money to the guy's campaign. And then there they said that you were asked about that and that you were tongue tied um, about, you know, well, okay, what do you say to this? This guy gives you money. I said he did. How is that being tongue tied? Yeah, I don't understand how it's being tongue tied either. But for the folks that are listening here, now listen, you know, this is this is where we get to the rubber meets the road type of situation. First of all, here's a guy he's serving. I don't know if you guys know what Delaware pays its senators, uh, its state senators, but it ain't much. You know, he's not he's not rolling up in a Maybach. So um, you know, he's he's a humble servant and. The fact of the matter is, is you shove a microphone in the guy's face and you say, ah, oh, yeah, well, this guy says that he gave money to your campaign. So so I want to address that really briefly. I'm going to address the whole I gave money to your campaign. So we're friends now. That's like saying I'm not a racist. I have black friends. That's like saying I'm not a homophobe. I'm related to some gay people. Um, it, it, it's it's tantamount to saying those things, which are just as stupid as anything else. But that ties in, Senator Lawson, that ties in to the next uh, thing, which is very, very important, is that host then made the statement and it's been made all across the country. You know, you do understand that the vast majority of Muslims, if you were an educated person and you didn't believe the ultra right wing extremist Christian hype against Muslims, you know, Muslims are the new Jews. If you didn't believe that, then you would know that there are exponentially more good Muslims than there are bad Muslims. And, and, and when I was interviewed on the West Coast, um, I, I said exactly this. I'm so glad you said that. Boy, is it my lucky day and your audience's lucky day. Why? Because I'm the least qualified. I'm super qualified to talk about a lot of things. But I am the least qualified to talk about math. But even I, with my basic Sussex County level mathematics, can tell you this is a math problem. And why it's a math problem is this and this alone. If, in fact, the vast majority of Muslims, and there's over well over one and a half billion Muslims in the world, if, in fact, only a tiny percentage, maybe 1%, are Muslims that are radical, that they are, air quotes, misinterpreting the Quran. If in fact, now you need to know, I have read the Quran more than 97% of Muslims worldwide. You say, we don't, that, no, this is their holy book. 97% of Muslims worldwide have never read the Quran. Why? Because their illiteracy rate is the highest in the world and they don't want them to read the quran they want these imams want them to know what it says based on here's what it says because i told you so now all that said to say this let's gather up the peaceful muslims who are very outspoken about the uh about you know uh, these terrible extremists and Let's gather you guys up and let's say we only take maybe, I don't know, 10%, maybe 10% of you peaceful, peaceful people, uh, which they're always saying that, you know, hey, uh, Islam means peace. 
which is not true. It, 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 um, they say that, uh, that many Muslim apologists claim that the root word of Islam is asala'am, which is peace in Arabic, but that's not true. Uh, an Arabic word has only one root, uh, al-silim, which means submission or surrender, is the actual root. Asalam is peace. So it's just flat out a lie, and and we know that from their own book. The point of all that is this. Okay, so we go back to the math thing, and we'll just use a, a blackboard, the old blackboard. Nowadays, you know, nobody uses a blackboard with some chalk. I think there's because the chalk is white, the black board is black, and then there we got a big racial thing, uh, white privilege going on. So, so we'll use, I don't know, whatever kind of thing. We'll write in crayon on the road, and uh, and and so you know we're gonna do that, and and we're gonna say these things. Um, we're gonna pick ten percent. So ten percent of the one point five billion people. Let's call it one point five. So ten percent of that. That's a whole lot of numbers. That's a whole lot of zeros. And then we're gonna say that one percent of all of Islam. So we've got ten percent of Islam, and then we've got this little tiny one percent of Islam. The majority of whom do not speak or read Arabic. They can't even read their own holy book. They have to have someone read it to them and tell them what it means. So this number, this 10% of the 1.5 billion, my math question today is why? Why in the world don't we teach that 10%, the 10% to, well, we'll arm them, we'll train them, and if they are so incensed by these mean people who, who are uh, sullying and soiling their very peaceful religion, why don't they fight them? Why don't they fight them? So, so we've got this guy coming on, and, and the, the radio host says, you know, you sound like a very reasonable guy. He says, I am. Trust me on this. I am. You know, I'm normal. I come here 30 years ago. Uh, I come to Dover. I am peaceful. I employ lots of people. There's people from 16 countries that work for me. Uh, you know, all these different things. And he said, I, I invite uh, Senator Lawson to my mosque. I will go with him. Same thing that the, uh, the doctor said, the one that, that, that read the air quotes prayer. He said, you know, I, I've offered it to him and, and he, hasn't taken, he hasn't taken me up on that. In fact, he hasn't communicated with me on that. Can you address that? Can you address that he, the, the guy who delivered the air quotes prayer uh, said that, you know, he has invited you to his mosque. Uh, he's invited you to a dialogue that he wants to work it out, that he sees this as a great opportunity for people to understand the truth about the peaceful religion, which is not a peaceful religion. It's, it is a religious, political and military ideology, not at all a religion. Um, so did he invite you to his mosque, and how did you respond to that? I have gotten uh, invitations there, but I'm not prepared at this point in time of other obligations. And plus, I need to uh, I sit here with the Quran in front of me right now. I've been studying all day and looking and seeing what's going on, so I can ask intelligent questions. Why would I walk in there ill-equipped? doesn't make right. any sense. Totally makes sense. Totally makes sense. We want to be prepared uh, when we go in, we want to be educated. So they never invite me to their mosques. They never invite me. Um, I do happen to have some Muslim friends who I know are uh, Muslim by birth and only by birth. Um, but th the fact of the matter is, is, is uh, it, it would be ill-advised for you to go, uh, especially, especially without a camera crew recording what's going on, uh, what's being said, what's, you know, because a lot of times what's being said and what's being reported to entirely different things. Because if you listen to the reports, uh, the, the news reports, you stomped out of there like a three-year-old having a tantrum in the grocery store and you commenced to pulling down milk off the aisles and cereal boxes and stomping <laughs> on the cereal boxes and then coming back in and, and screaming and yelling. And if I'm hearing you right and if our audience is hearing you correctly, that's not what happened. So then they say, they say that they, that when you came back in, you made a scene with the, with the guest and he was disrespected. We now know that didn't happen. As with many, many things, just like this United Airlines situation, the truth is starting to come out now that this, this is not remotely what was put out. What makes me mad is the press, even what's considered to be fair and balanced press, 
only put out enough of the video or only enough of the sound bites, the part that sounds bad, the part that makes the part that sounds bad not bad, they wait until well down the road. Hey, we can get a lot of stories out of this. We can be on the front page. We can uh, we can get retweeted. So that's exactly what I believe has happened here in the um, in in the legislative hall of the state of Delaware. Now, have you had any opportunity to speak to uh, Lieutenant Governor Bethany Hall Long about this? Yes, Thursday after session, she came to me and apologized. She felt that she didn't uh, handle it very well and she wanted to put this behind us and move on, and I totally agree. So now you're going to have to slow down, Slam Dancer. I, I'm confused here, because how come I haven't heard that in the news? I haven't heard anything about know. Bethany Hall Long, the lieutenant governor. Uh, you know what? She actually went to Senator Dave Lawson and apologized, not the other way around. Well, That's I would correct. think that would be big news. That would be huge news. My goodness, I, I would just be ecstatic to hear that but in fact i didn't hear that and th there's something really really wrong with that i wasn't about to go out and, and inflame the situation anymore she is the leader of the senate and it's that's what you know she came and and i felt it was heartfelt and i yeah. was fine with it and and that for me was sufficient sure sure recent studies show that roughly one-third of muslims in the united states would prefer to live under Sharia than our Constitution. Now, the reason I made that statement is because you recently uh, put up a bill to uh, ban Sharia in the state of Delaware, which I fully and completely support. Uh, there's no place for Sharia law here in the United States. If they want Sharia, they want to live under Sharia, then they move to a Muslim country. Uh, that's, but that it doesn't just makes single sense. out. It doesn't single out Sharia. It says American laws for American courts. It mm -hmm. would, if passed, would outlaw any foreign uh, law coming in and inter interfering with our judicial system. Uh, whether the combatants were of the same religion or not, this is happening across our United States. I've got documented cases, 146 of them, where Sharia law was the, term, the determining law for the outcome of the case. Right. Well, I'm confused here because if you are listening to the press, the press says that you're just all about bashing Islam and that you put this oh uh, law Now, I said it. I know I know what it's entitled because you've shared it with me and I've I've read pieces of it. So I knew that it wasn't that. So in full disclosure, I want the audience to understand. I knew it wasn't that. But the fact of the matter is, it's not being reported that way, just like President Trump's uh, ban on Muslims. You know, they keep saying this, and there's nowhere in any of the uh, the verbiage of the bill or the executive order that talks about banning Muslims. But what we do know is that there is a huge, huge uh, proportion of the people who are coming into this country uh, under the cloak of, uh, you know, they're, they're uh, refugees and they're immigrating to the United States. And, and all of these things that this is, oh, these poor people, we've got to be Christian. It's funny that the, the left never wants us to be Christian until it comes to something they want. And then they'll pervert the gospel to achieve their means. Now, I want to address something really, really quickly because I feel like uh, I've had a lot of people ask me about it. And, and I want to know uh, where you stand with it. But And that is this. They say there's one camp that says, hey, look, you know how you solve this? You don't have prayer. Because we've got, the Constitution says we've got separation of church and state. We've got separation of church and state. So it's all over the Constitution. I think it's even written in red. I think it's written in red, probably even. And so we've got that. We're not even allowed to have, we're not allowed to have any kind of uh, religion in there. So they're violating the law, the Constitution. So let's get that out of there and problem solved. What do you say to that? What do I say to that? Uh, well, first yes. of all, they misunderstand the, the separation of church and state, uh, the way it was meant, the way it was done. That is totally confusing. And furthermore, to try and do away with prayer in this country is just pushing God further away. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, is, is if folks study history just as hard as I've studied um, Islam, I've also studied American history and our founders. And what I find is... It's very interesting to me uh, 
and, and, and it cracks me up because I hear these people talk about and they pride themselves on how learned they are. And yet they do all this talking about what's in the Constitution. And in fact, number one, they don't like the Constitution. They they impugn the value of the Constitution. The Constitution, as far as they are concerned, is uh, an outdated document written by a bunch of slave owners. Um, and and so, you know, half the time they're talking bad about the Constitution to start with. But then all of a sudden they want to quote something that's not in the Constitution. The uh, the uh, the Baptist Association, um, I'm trying to think of uh, Concord Baptist Association. No, it's not that. Um, oh, I can't remember. They So this Baptist Association sends a letter to President uh, Jefferson and says, hey, you know, we don't want to be forced into the Anglican or any other faith. We want to be able, you're working on this document you're working on. We don't want any that. And so in, in the letter, the Danbury Baptist, Danbury, Connecticut, he writes back and he says, hey, there's not going to be any forced religion. In fact, there will be a separation of church and state. So you will not be forced to, to assume a religion that the state dictates upon you or forces upon you. You'll be able to serve how you want to serve. But that doesn't uh, undermine or erase true and real history, which is we are a Judeo-Christian organization. This country of uh, the United States of America were founded on biblical principles. And so in the underpinnings, the utter foundation and cornerstone of our country, whether people want to erase it or not, the fact is, is the prayers that we have, that we should be having from the floors of our general assemblies all across the country and in Washington, D.C., are prayers of the founding fathers' faith, what they built in. Uh, this this inviting Islam in it is just pandering, which I don't understand. I, you know, I've never understood this. I've studied this for many years, and I still don't understand it. Why in the world do people uh, so vigorously support a religious, political, and, I, and military ideology that wants to kill them? Doesn't might maybe want to kill them. The LGBT community, it never ceases to amaze me. They are constantly... Uh, locking arms with Muslims and saying, hey, we're your brother, I support Islam. Uh, it, it makes no sense to me other than to say when they claim their high level of uh, intelligence and education, what they really mean is they watch a lot of television news because they're not remotely accurate. And the, and the, the religious, political, and military ideology of Islam banks on that. They bank on weak need. Christians and pastors who will not stand up and say, whoa, 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 slow down here. We're not having this in our country because they want to kill. They don't want to kill Christians. They are killing Christians. They don't want to kill Jews. They are killing Jews all around the world. So then the next big statement comes on. Well, uh, Dr. Greener, Senator Lawson, this is where you're wrong because more Muslims are killed in terror attacks than any other people, any other people. And I always answer it this way, which is true. When a Muslim dies, whether they knew there was a bomb on the bus or whether the lorry driving down the road, the beer truck driving down the road was going to drive up on the sidewalk and run them over, whether they knew the person walking beside them uh, had a backpack full of a pressure cooker with a bomb in it, whether they knew that or not, if they are Muslim, they are part of jihad, and even they were totally ignorant of, of the event, they are a Muslim killed in jihad, which means they are elevated by their faith to be um, a jihadist. So they have a higher level of paradise. And um, it, it comes down, it, it really comes down to this, that, that it, it is a function of Islam that they are not called innocent when you die in the... Um, in, 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 a, in a jihad attack, when you die in that attack, even though you knew nothing about it, you are, uh, you are uh, a, uh, a jihadist. You, you're part of the struggle. You're, you are fighting with us. Now, the problem comes in when people say the following statement, and it's been said about you. Um, uh, I, on many of the interviews I was in, they said it, and I corrected them immediately, whether it was a caller or the host, and, and and this is the thing. Well, you know, he ought to get out of his redneck part of town or part of that little state of Delaware, the little Kent County. He ought to get out of that redneck place 
climb out of the church pew once in a while and go meet some actual Muslims because it sounds to me like he's ignorant and he doesn't know anything about Muslims. You know, I just have to say, Senator Lawson, you know, first of all, I thought they're the tolerant ones and they're saying you're intolerant, yet they're the ones saying that you're the ignorant one, the uneducated ignorant one, and you don't ever leave your house except to go to church and, and go to the legislative hall where you're going to stomp out when something doesn't go, go your way. Well, it's okay for them to sit back and take shots at people they don't know, but they don't like it whenever people take shots at them or, or bring the truth. You know, our, our society today is not prepared for the truth. To quote a movie right. say, statement, you can't handle the truth. Right, 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 right. Uh, so so they're not prepared for that. And I always, uh, I always just, you know, I try to educate them and, and just try to work through and let them see that, look, you know, in, a, in the United States of America, you know, uh, we, we always hear about jihad. Well, jihad uh, doesn't mean, I heard this, one of the Muslims that was being interviewed says, you know, people are constantly talking, people who know nothing about Islam say jihad uh, means something other than what it means. It just means inner struggle. It means, you know, a striving for perfection and peaceful, uh, peaceful perfection and, and to do that. And, and so it's, it doesn't have anything to do with war. Now, uh, in Arabic, the truth of the matter is, in Arabic, jihad means struggle. Uh, and, and that, within the tenets of the religious, political, and military ideology of Islam, means holy war. This is just a fact. This is not me making this up. This is a fact, according to their own documents, their own sacred documents. The Quran specifically exempts the disabled and elderly from jihad. Surah 495. Uh, they would, it wouldn't make any sense if the word's being used uh, within the context of a spiritual struggle. Why, w why would the disabled and the elderly be uh, precluded from it? And, uh, and, the, and the fact of the matter is, is, is throughout the Quran, smiting fingers and heads from the hands and necks of unbelievers or infidel, that's me, if, if he were merely speaking of character development, why would that be the case? And, and so that brings me to the next step of, um, for me personally, I, and I like to say, I travel around this country teaching about this. For me, it's never going to put me in a positive light when I stand up and say, oh, well, hold on a second. How about some truth here? How about what it really means? what Islam really means, what the Quran really means, and what it means to us. Now, all of that big thing to say this, they said, you know, I think that uh, that Senator Dave Lawson ought to take us up on our offer to invite him to come to our mosque. You've already said, rightly so, hey, I'm, I'm not going in there until I study up a little bit, until I prepare. Um, I, I, I will give an example of what I would perhaps say. I would say, tell you what, let's do. I'll come to your mosque in Delaware when I can go and do the same thing in a mosque in Saudi Arabia, your, what's considered the, pardon the pun, Mecca of your faith. When I can go in to your mosque and talk about Christ without being killed, I'll come to your mosque here in Delaware. John, you know, it's funny you say that because I said that to uh, Masur Awad in, a, in an exchange of text messages. I said, you know, I would not be allowed to go into your state building or any other uh, mosque or anything else and read from my Bible, pray to my God in a foreign language. I would not be allowed. Right. He said, oh, 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 well, this isn't uh, Jordan. We're in America. I said, whoa, okay. So you agree then that I couldn't do that. I mean, apparently by his statement, he agrees that, that I wouldn't be allowed to do that in her home country. So that's already been clarified by the man that was being interviewed uh, by that show that you mentioned earlier. Right. Right. So so now we know there's there's an intense double standard. Um, and, and the fact of the matter is, is, look, um, the, when the infidel enters the mosque, uh, you have immediately dirtied the mosque, according to Islam, the religious, political, and military ideology of Islam. You've soiled that. So there's a whole process that they do in order to um, in, in order to cleanse it. cleanse it. There's some things that they have to do, and it's pretty elaborate. It's it's a real elaborate thing. And um, and then I have a, a thousand examples, and I know that you're on your way somewhere, so I, I don't want to keep you any longer than 
than uh, would inconvenience you. But what what I want to ask you is this: is what's next for you? Um, because I don't think this is dying off in the state of Delaware, and frankly, I don't think it's dying off anywhere in the United States. But I want to preface uh, my question to you with: there are many statements that, uh, and, and your bill obviously is not an anti-Sharia bill, but it is a it is an American law only uh, bill, which I like. And quite frankly, I don't understand why that's so hard for people to grasp. I mean, come on now. Well, why wouldn't it be? This is our country. If we don't have walls, we don't have borders. If we aren't sovereign, we don't have a country. We don't have a country well, if, we, was, if we can't. That bill ahead. was introduced last year, and it was killed in committee by uh, Senator Henry and Senator Blevins. So, so that's just uh, you know, something that's going on today with this fight. That isn't it. It has nothing to do with it. It was introduced last year and, and got nowhere. It was killed in committee. Never got the light to see the light of day. I'm going to reintroduce it. And it has nothing to do with it's an ongoing fight and I'm um, an uh, Islamophobe or anything else. Uh, the, the people that like to hurl those names should look in the mirror. Well, and you know, uh, Sharia has no place. Uh, I'll, I'll just say it straight out because I don't, I don't have. This is, you know, my name's on the show, and I'll stand by anything I say. Uh, Sharia has no place anywhere outside a 100% Muslim country. And make no mistake about it, the Muslims that are driving this discussion, no matter how nice they appear, remember there's something called takia, which is lying for the advancement of Islam, and um, there it is. the. the there has been a, a great number of people who have said, look, religious freedom, all religions, we welcome all religions, but that's not how it works because this religion of um, the religious, political, and military ideology of Islam, they don't seek to coexist with anyone. They seek to dominate, to completely, uh, to completely overwhelm the enemy, not just their, their Quran, but the Umdad al-Salik, which is the reliance of the traveler, um, that's a, a much longer document, but it's by Muslims, how to be Muslim for Muslims. It, it explains in great detail every aspect of the of the uh, Quran. So they, they are not remotely tolerant of any other religion. I think um, it, it, it always surprises me that people don't study history because whenever Islam has uh, entered into a country, even when they're invited in as, air quotes, refugees, they seek to take over. Once they get a large enough number, it becomes a military ideology. Their own book in Surah 109 in the Quran says, uh, to you, your religion, to me, mine. Uh, they, uh, religious minorities, they, they've, um, a lot of times they will say, well, I don't seek to do any harm to Islam. Uh, we, you know, we, you know, we're just peaceful people. And and the myth, the takia of Islam is, hey, religious minorities, we've gotten along great with them. We've protected them. Listen, we're our own Quran tells us to protect Jews and Christians and to do no harm to them. And, and in fact, you know, hey, Surah 109, the Quran says to you, your religion, to me, mine. But, but that's a total and complete lie. Everywhere they've gone and they've... Uh, achieved any level of dominance, which starts between six and 9% of the population. When they get to 13%, they are absolutely in control. Um, they will dwindle to shadows, dwindle to shadows because uh, for instance, in Muslim countries, it, you'll see them, the first choice to rape is a Christian or a Jewish woman first, always first. And rape is a big issue uh, in Muslim countries. It's a huge issue. And but the first one they seek to do, but see in Islam, if you rape a Westerner or a Jew, a Christian or a Jew, you're not committing rape. That's part of the you're winning jihad, you're winning the war, man. And people say, well, that doctor that was on the radio, he didn't sound like he was doing anything like that. In fact, he kept saying over and over and over, look, we're nice people. These other people doing these things, we don't want anything to do with them. They're not, you know, we don't even know what they're following. But if they went to ISIS and they stood up to them face to face and said, hey, you're not supposed to be doing this. You're, you're misinterpreting the Quran. Um, and they weren't committing uh, takia. They weren't using lying for the advancement of Islam. They would absolutely be viewed immediately, instantly as an apostate and they would be killed. They would be killed. 
So as it relates to Sharia, even though it's it's an American law first, um, your proposal is, is very wise and, and makes total sense. Even though that's the case, I will say, uh, as a ninja pastor, I don't want Sharia anywhere in this country, but too late, it already is here. But the callers call in and, and they say, and they say, look, what have we to fear of Sharia? What difference does it make? Um, oh my. I, I, don't, I don't understand. What difference does it make? If they want to have their own laws, why shouldn't they? Well, so each segment gets to pick their own laws. Wow. Sure. There's a united sure. country. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? Why not? Um, you know, and, and we 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 uh, we take an oath to the Constitution, which they cannot do without lying. Um, you know, the the uh, guy said, "Look, there's there's many Muslims in the military. Concerns me deeply. Uh, there are over 935 Muslim police officers working uh, as outward Muslims in New York City. There are over 750 Muslims, we're told, in the city of Philadelphia." And they're serving. They're serving with us. The problem is they cannot, by the tenet of their own faith, by their own Quran, they cannot swear an allegiance to our Constitution. So when they do that oath in the military or as a police officer or as, even as a political uh, person, they can't do it without lying. Now, so my question to you is the next step for you, because I know you have to go and we have another guest coming on after you. The next step for you is what? What's the next step for you? Uh, or maybe there's not another step. Maybe it's, hey, you know what? I'm going to let this just go uh, because, you know, it can't last forever. And I'll keep representing what, what I believe is right for the constituency that I serve. And let that be that. Well, my next uh, move, or if you want to call it that, the plan is simply to uh, put this bill forward for sponsors, which I've got several sponsors already and uh, move it toward committee again and see if we can get it on the floor for a vote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so that's why. Yeah. Go ahead. I will continue uh, studying the, the Quran and so I have a better handle on it. And I, I, I really want to know more about it, and I'm doing that now. And uh, uh, certainly I'm looking forward to the meeting with uh, Dr. Uh, Bakar and see what we can do, because I, I think there are those who are truly trying to change the concept and precepts of the Muslim faith. I think there are those that are saying, wait a minute, this is not the way to go. We cannot continue to act as we did 1,400 years ago. Right. And that's what's happening in those areas. And, and it's time for them to evolve and get be up here and be a and there's a lot of them that want to be friendly and want to want to just coexist. And I totally agree with that effort. However, when it says you must rally the believers to fight for Allah, if you're a believer, you have no choice. If you say right. you're a Muslim, you have no choice. Well, it comes back to the math problem that I talked about. If only 1% yeah. of this 1.5 billion are radicalized and uh, trouble, why can't the other 99% squash them like a bug? It doesn't seem like they have any intention to do so. Well, the reason why is because even if they said that, unless they were speaking from a point of taqiyya, they lying for the advancement of Islam, they would be killed. So they're, they're caught in the middle, the ones that are trying to do it right. And, and I, I certainly empathize with them to a degree sure. yeah. that if they are trying to do it right, more power to them. But where is the mass to stand up and say, no, we've got to stop this. So again, is that the deceit or is it absolute where they are trying to do? I think that they have their, they're caught between a rock and a hard spot. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And in fact, we know stories in ISIS when they, um, you know, when they're, when they're sweeping through a country, they, you know, they're, they're committing uh, just, incredible atrocities. I mean, we're talking about setting people on fire uh, live, and put them in a cage and, and just light them on fire, douse them with gasoline, light them on fire. We're, we're talking about uh, putting people in a, a steel cage and, and dunking them until they drown. We're talking about cutting people's heads off, throwing people off the building, uh, burning them to their shoulders and stoning them, uh, burning them with acid, you know, all of the other things that go on. These are 
key parts of Islam. And so when they are traveling through these places and, and they want uh, complete and total adherence to Islam, they will kill whoever they have to kill who stands in their way. But they will also kill, and we've, we've seen many, many cases of this, where the ISIS fighter says, look, you know, I'm tired. I just don't want to do this anymore. You know, all this cutting people's heads off is wearing me out. I've got carpal tunnel from all of it. Uh, well, guess what? They're next. The blade will be laid to their neck because they are an apostate. They are weak in the eyes of Allah, which uh, they are not the same God. Allah, we do not worship the same God. That is not the same person uh, by any stretch. And so anyway, well, look, I know you have to go and we have another guest coming on. And uh, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to explain to us what happened. Most of what you said, uh, you know, we we haven't even uh, we haven't even heard it. Uh, it's just been the narrative has been so narrowly presented, and and it's always that way. I remember protecting people, and and I would be literally four feet away from them. They'd be at NBC or CNN or one of these other places. And they would absolutely, I would hear the whole interview, but when the interview played on television, it didn't remotely look like what I had just been four foot away and heard. Didn't, didn't, didn't nothing like it at all. So uh, we know that they will twist. And I want you to know that we absolutely are behind you here at the Collision of Faith and Politics. Um, everywhere I speak and preach, I tell people, pray for Dave Lawson. He needs your prayers. Uh, we need to support him. And then we have people from all over the country, and in fact, all over the world, uh, from Ohio, who are saying thank you from Ohio for standing up. Thank you from New York for standing up. Uh, there are people listening right now in Belgium, Germany, uh, France, Spain, Ukraine, uh, actual retired Special Forces officer from the United States, um, listening, lives there. Uh, thank you for standing up because it, it takes some personal fortitude, some intestinal fortitude to do it. And I appreciate you doing it. And they will ridicule you, but we are behind you and we won't, uh, we will not leave your side. Absolutely not. Well, Sean, I can say that I received phone calls from the majority of the states. My goodness, New York, Alabama, Mississippi, Mississippi, Missouri, Wisconsin, Oregon, it has just been phenomenal, the support. And I thank you so much for that. And I thank all of them. It, and I tried to call most of them back. I haven't gotten to all of them, but I certainly uh, want them to know how much I appreciate their support. And uh, I will continue doing what I believe is best. If the people no longer think that I'm doing a good job and they, they don't need me there anymore, I would really like to go fishing. There you go. If I, maybe I'll go fishing okay. with you. You'll have to teach me how to fish, but I'll go fishing with you. <laughs> well, brother, thank, thank you so you. much thank for you very coming much on, for the Senator friendship. Lawson. It's my pleasure. Right. Take good care and be safe. So there you have it, Senator Dave Lawson. Uh, and and uh, couldn't meet a nicer guy. I'm telling you, I've known the guy a long time. He is truly a fair person. Uh, he is a thinking man. He thinks before he speaks. And now you hear the rest of the story. Didn't quite look like it, just like United Airlines, uh, you know, that would go on and on and on about, my goodness, the guy pays for a seat, he should have a seat, and he shouldn't be dragged off. This could happen to anybody, you know, and I kept telling people, listen, hold on now, slow down, slam dancer. There is more to the story than what you are being told. You are being lied to. Uh, this man, first of all, is not a good person on this aircraft. Second of all, it was the second time he'd been on. He'd already been escorted off, and he ran back on, and then he's on the phone calling a lawyer saying, you know, get ready to sue United Airlines. 